morning, Philip. Good morning. Lovely to, to see you here this morning. And um, thank you for joining me. And for those of you who don't know, this is Philip Brooks Stevenson. He is one of the directors of Cuckoo. But I'm going to pass it over to him to actually introduce himself fully and tell us a little bit about Cuckoo. And then we will explore his journey of motivation, inspiration to share with you all. Over to you, Philip. Well, uh, good morning, Sarah. Firstly, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Philip Brooks Stevenson, one of the co-founders of Cuckoo Connect. Cuckoo Connect is a business membership service connecting businesses and entrepreneurs across the East Midlands. Yeah, and it's fantastic. I mean, I've been a member, I think, a couple of years now, and that's obviously how we met. And I don't even know how I actually started, how, how I came across coming along to the Cuckoo events, but they really are completely different from a networking perspective because it's not it is networking but it's not it's just it's such an informal but almost lu luxurious but it, that makes it sound like it's exclusive because it's not and it's just so warm it's so welcoming and we always always have such a great time and it's food it's usually in a great location there's food laid on usually by the people and it's usually by members so you've got this whole sort of interaction of of people combining collaborating and and it's just lovely. You've not got to stand up and go, hello, I'm Sarah, and this is what I do. It's just about building up relationships with people, which is, which is fabulous, which I think is really your story, isn't it? So uh, I'm going to just take us right the way back to the beginning, because your story starts probably where people wouldn't expect it to start. Um, and that's if probably if we started about age nine, and if you would like to sort of just explain to people what happened to you aged nine yes well um it was all very odd really and especially to a nine-year-old and, and maybe it sounds a bit pompous at, at saying it but uh, essentially i think that um my <coughs> infant school and junior school had decided in their wisdom that i was musically talented um so essentially i went along to a place called southern minster which is the main cathedral in nottinghamshire uh, and went for what was called a voice trial. And then the next thing I knew, I'd been accepted as a, a, a scholar at um, Southern Minster and as a cathedral chorister. And how did that make you feel at that time? Um, well, uh, partly I don't overly remember. I remember being exceptionally nervous um, and I had, to, I had to prepare a song. So um, I had some music teachers at my junior school who were all raring for me to uh, succeed. Um, I think because, so this is what, 1989 time, uh, or maybe 1988. So it was seen as a, a really great opportunity. And I think that's why uh, my family and my teachers were all behind me to say, well, this will be a great opportunity for you. Um, but yes, it seems very odd to think, or to refer to yourself as someone, uh, even at that age, as sort of musically talented. But um, I guess I had some sort of raw, raw something in me uh, and then I um, went off to boarding school at, at Southern Minster. Yeah I mean I for one I didn't even know there was a boarding school at Southern Minster but I mean that is a big thing isn't it at age nine to go away to boarding school. Were you a full board or did you board did you come home at the weekends? Well no um, because of course being in the, um, the choir at Southern Minster of course part of what we were doing our duties were to perform services so we, we sang services every single day apart from Wednesdays. And of course that included Saturday and two services on a Sunday. So <clears throat> there just wasn't the opportunity to go home. So um, half terms, you know, Easter, Christmas, school holidays um, is, is kind of when we went home. And occasionally there would be um, midterm, there would be what was called a, an exit weekend where we'd be allowed for sort of the weekend off and that would be a home weekend. But generally we were there all the time. So not only were you having lessons that you, you, you were obviously having the music lessons on top of your school lessons, and then on top of all of that, you yeah. would be actually doing the performances. So actually, you were working really hard from a very, very early age. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because when I, uh, when I tell people about my kind of daily routine when I was I don't know, 10, 11 years old, they kind of gasp in horror and think, how awful. But of course, you know, when you... Uh, used to, at that age, you kind of just go along with things, and it was all a little bit surreal. Um, I, I, I kind of remember at the time, but you just get used to it, and you go along. And of course, there are 
others with you that have come from other parts of the country. So, you know, you're not on your own um, and you, you kind of get on and do it. Uh, but kind it was, of a level of acceptance there that this was part of your life and it was you, yes. you, you kind of got on with it. Yeah. But how, how did it feel suddenly being taken from, you know, your home life into, you know, into a boarding school? What was that like for you? Well, I think it was very scary and I was quite nervous at that age of, uh, I, I was, I wouldn't describe myself as someone that was sort of centre of attention. I would almost kind of swerve away from um, centre of attention. And um, I think I'm probably one of those children that probably was always sort of hanging on to my mother when I was very, very young. So it was quite the opposite to kind of being an extrovert uh, mm -hmm. at that age. So it was very daunting and very nervous, but you, you slowly got used to it and you just slowly built your confidence up. And of course you're um, in with a, a group of boys um, who are all in the same situation. So you're kind of growing and learning together and of course you get to know each other and of course you're living with the same people. So it's not quite the same as a family, but it's, you know, you have that camaraderie that um, you kind of grow up with. But, um, mm. but no, but at the same time then there were things that would come along that were interesting or exciting. Um, and, and I suppose that counterbalanced the scary stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember talking to you um, a few days ago about, as you say, the exciting things, because I think you've, you've met, whilst you were in school, you've met, you had that, you know, opportunity to meet some incredible people and perform for them as well, didn't you? Um, well, yes. I mean, I think that, you know, some of the, um, in any county, the cathedral is always kind of a, a ceremonial centre, as well as a, a religious one, and also pastoral and community uh, uh, place as well. So, um, you came across people and roles that perhaps you well you wouldn't know anything about if you uh, at that age in general so things like lord lieutenants and high sheriffs you know they would be constantly in contact with um you know Southminster. so you know each year uh there would be something called the queen's birthday service where essentially um <clears throat> there was a big civic service that took place uh, at Southall. Uh, you know, people would come and they'd be wearing their medals and tails and top hats and things. Uh, and it was a real celebration of people that had, um, you know, served Nottinghamshire in some way. Uh, so there were some really important and influential people that were in and out of, of Southern Minster all the time. Um, and the Queen visited uh, Southall. Um, so there was a, a one point where we sang to the Queen. Uh, and there were all sorts of things. I mean, we went on, uh, you know, and it's not until you start talking about it that, of course, you remember these things. It was such a long time ago, because I'm just 40 now. Um, so, you know, when I was nine, it's a long time ago now. <laughs> but we also, uh, and we didn't talk about this, but uh, we went on tour. So we went on um, tour to, um, to France, to the Czech Republic, where, you know, we went around and, you know, did concerts and things. Um, and I suppose there are opportunities that not everybody gets to have, you know, through their their schooling or at such a young age um but also i think it um in a way it also helps you develop and grow uh, from a maturity point of view at that age because you're meeting a lot of adults and absolutely that's what i was going to say i mean there is that part of it isn't there you know it you know you've had that that, that, that richness of that experience so you it's so that actually sort of i suppose um balances out that sort of you've been taken from your family because of your talent but then you've been given and presented this these amazing opportunities which obviously no. form and create the part of the bedrock of who you become as a person because you've you've been in the company of people like you've said they're influential people they're people that have served they're people that have done so much for the sort of the, the, the county for the country um, and to sort of be in the presence of those people I can only but imagine how you know, inspiring it can be. I mean, I know just even being in Southern Minster, I mean, I love it when, I have to say, I tend to go in as a craft fair on, but, you know, when I go into Southern Minster, it's just, it's just such an incredibly beautiful yes. building from an architectural perspective, and you just, it's just mesmerising, and you can spend so long in there just looking and yeah. being and absorbing the energy. So to couple that with the people that then you've, come into contact yeah. with it must have been quite something really which you perhaps as you said to appreciate in, in reflection if you like yes yeah yeah because at the time you were sort of going through it but you know the minister was so much more than you know just a, a church um you know it was a playground it was very much a home um 
there was a funny story where uh, I, I think I was probably a little bit older by this point, but um, so there are two organs. I mean, the organs are huge, great things with pipes that are meters and meters of long. Um, there was a new organ being put in during my time at Southall. Of course, the organs um, are high up in the um, in cathedrals, so they're on kind of levels where, at that time, health and safety was kicking in. So, of course, people weren't allowed to go up into the towers and, and high up. Um, but the um, at the time, the choristers were allowed to go up one level to go and see the organ being um, put in because it was thought that this was um, you know, educational to us. Of course, being boys, young boys, <laughs> Because we were completely unsupervised, oh. we just thought, oh, I wonder what goes up to the next level and to the next level, until we came out and found the roof. Um, and if you look at Southall's famous roof, it's what's called its two pepper pots. But just behind there is a, a roof, which, I mean, it sounds terribly dangerous. It wasn't that bad, but it's essentially a lead roof. So we'd go up onto the roof and we'd slide down the roof. Oh. Um, until one day, I think um, the story goes that a... a, a an elderly lady thought maybe she'd seen an angel, um, reported it to uh, uh, the minister who thought otherwise, and, and then we're all in trouble. Um, so, uh, so yeah. <laughs> it, it was a, it was a, I suppose a, um, it, it, it was a, I suppose a golden childhood in a way to kind of grow up in that environment and and see lots of different things that you wouldn't ordinarily. Of course, uh, you know, you pointed out that there was the downside that you're not at home with your family. And I think that, um, you know, my family didn't ever want me to go away to a boarding school. I think it was just that it was, it was seen as a really great opportunity that not many people would ever have. And so, you know, that I did. But actually, I would speak to my parents two, three times a week, uh, and they would come up and see me most weekends. Cool. Uh, presumably, were, were, were you, you were Nottingham based anyway, were you? Were the family well, I, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I still am. So right out on the borders of Nottinghamshire. So there was a ruling because, of course, we had to be at uh, our morning choir rehearsal started. I think it started at 8.15 in the morning, eight o'clock time. Mm -hmm. um, so to get from where I lived over to there each day just wouldn't be viable. So there was a rule that if you lived more than... I can't remember, 10, 15 minutes away from um, the cathedral, then you had to be a boarder. But equally so, that was it was close enough for your family to come and visit regularly, which, yeah, which no, is nice. Yeah, no, because I was lucky, because some of my uh, you know, fellow choristers at the time were from places like Bedfordshire, Wales, uh, so they wouldn't see their, their family as much. Sure. So I was lucky in that respect. But, I mean, so we, we, so we've, we've kind of explored the, 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 you know, the greatness of it and the, you know, in, in reflection, all of that sort of, wonder and explore but it also brought with it there were, there were elements to it that weren't so pleasant weren't there because I remember you saying well yeah so um so Southernminster was also the local school as well as the boarding school um so actually we were a, a tiny percentage uh, as a choristers were a tiny percentage of the pupils at the school um and as always with schools and you know sort of children if you're a little bit different or you do something different from anyone else, then you're prime target for kind of, you know, sort of bullying and being left out and seem to be to be different. And, uh, you know, again, one of the, the, I suppose, the challenges was that because of the music rehearsal, by the time we got to school, we'd miss the kind of people arriving at school, we'd miss the morning assembly because there just wasn't time for that. And we'd go straight into our lessons. So we were always one step removed from all the other uh, pupils. And of course, maybe when um, other pupils, when they finish school, might go and play at someone's house or you go for tea or supper with someone's family. We couldn't do that. We couldn't do things like cubs and scouts and those sorts of things, because as soon as we would finished school, we'd wolf down some supper. And then we'd be back for another rehearsal at, um, at Southern Minster and then a service and then homework uh, and some music practice. And then that was I'm tired just thinking about all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was tough I mean, going. I guess the, the problem was though that they didn't they didn't see that they saw one aspect, and it, it is it's all about perception, isn't it? They the, there is a there would be a vision of that and a perception of what that actually meant. But actually, you know, the reverse could be true because you could be completely envious of that sort of freedom that they had. But yeah. it's all about us all being different and embracing our differences yeah. and, and working together true. and collaborating, which I guess is what's propelled you forward but you've obviously had to show resilience at that age 
as well as you know all the things that you were you know obviously privileged to but then you obviously had that again counteracted with that sort of being pointed out oh you're different so we're not going to like that you know yeah, no, absolutely um, I mean, it's just the the usual thing of if you're in the um the school football team or rugby team then that's very macho and that's okay but if you're singing in a choir and you're wearing a cassock which is essentially a bit like a bottomed up dress and that's um you know you're going to kind of be a figure of fun for for some people unfortunately but at the same time there's such a great community because the whole school was a, a musical special school um that there was a great musical community and artistic community within the school so you could you know you could step away and almost immerse yourself in the art side of things mm -hmm. to kind of get away from from budding but yeah you know that was that was the case and i think you know uh you know that was probably quite commonplace i think mm -hmm. you know, but it was just the reality so yeah but then you you stayed on i think i remember you saying for sort of a levels didn't you or did you come away for a levels did you go somewhere no, no, else um so i stayed um uh i was able to my parents kept me at Southernminster till i finished my gcse's uh because it was a great school mm -hmm. uh, so i did that but then i wasn't really quite sure what i wanted to do because when you get to a level time most people are selecting subjects that they want to take them into a qualification or to university i didn't really know and i don't think i could ever say that i was the most academic focused person and partly because of course i got music as the big thing in my life then so um i sometimes wonder how i managed to scrape together my my gcse's i did quite well actually in the end um but the time and the attention that i had to actually learn on mainstream education was quite limited mm -hmm. um, so um i came uh home when i think i was probably about 17 uh and went to a relatively local sixth form mm -hmm. um, to do a levels yeah and then you decided i remember you saying to me that you just because you had the option then to go to university but i think you just chose not to having spent so much time away from from home yeah. you decided to stay you know and good for you you made a decision that felt right for you from following your instinct that you know you wanted to actually have some time with the family that yeah, you no, not I, really had yeah i did two things i think um <clears throat> i almost when i came home and and, uh, and started a levels because i'd been away from my locality my home since the age of nine i didn't have any local friends so i was very very keen not to be the odd person out and to fit in and blend in with this new group of people or doing a levels so I kind of suppressed and hid my boarding school musical side. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I think I focused all my time into parties and socialising and getting to know people. Uh, again, far more than the educational side. And there was something in me that said, um, maybe university isn't right for you at the moment, because I kind of knew that I'd have great enthusiasm for going to university and starting it, but I wasn't particularly interested in <coughs> leaving home again because of course I'd been away from home. I wasn't really looking forward to having to make a brand new group of friends because it was a bit daunting. Um, and I also knew that I wouldn't really focus on the work and I'd just spend all the time socialising and I thought then I've just wasted a few years and a load of money. So, that was so you, you made that decision and, and obviously I know from our prior dis discussions, you know, you then sort of got into, into sort of the working you know it, it sort of threw yourself into into work and really i guess what you did over the next sort of seven you know the next year the next several i don't know what couple of decades no not quite as much a couple of decades but thereabouts you know you've kind of built on what experiences have you had and um and obviously work within the sort of field that's very communicative but you've also done a huge amount of charity work and worked within the charity sector as in, in addition to doing charity work that's voluntary as yeah. well so you know can, can you sort of take us on a sort of a, a short journey through okay. that because i want to explain to people where, where you where you've been and what you've been doing but you know how you've recognized that to obviously when we come up to the present day all of that partying instinct from sort of <laughs> you have now made into a career which is absolutely awesome <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, yeah well i yes i guess in, in some aspects um so my first so i finished my a-levels that all went well i decided made that decision not to go to university it wasn't right for me um and actually i i got my first job um and i think i had the grand title of something like 
assistant manager or project manager, something like that. So I thought I, I didn't quite well to get that sort of level of job as my first job because I would have been 19, I think, going on 20. Definitely, uh, I would agree, yeah. Yeah, um, but the opportunity came through, the fact that I'd done volunteering um, from probably the age of sort of 17. Um, I mean, one could say I did a lot of volunteering from the age of nine because, you, you know, being a chorister isn't a paid job. Um, <laughs> indeed, indeed. That, that got me into it. But I'm just fortunate to have come from a, a, a really great family I'm very proud of and have always been an inspiration and a motivation for me where getting involved in the community, uh, you know, helping people, charity, volunteering was just kind of part of life. Um, it wasn't a, you must go and do this. It was just, you know, you just grew up knowing that. So um, uh, that's how I managed to get my first job because I'd been volunteering and obviously the organisation had valued that volunteering and, uh, and it got me that opportunity. So, yeah, and I think um, that's a great, great thing. I just really want to just sort of, sorry to interrupt that I, I want to explain to people listening that this is what voluntary work can bring, you know, opportunity. Yeah. Not just the opportunity, but that experience and, um, and those experiences that enrich your life mm -hmm. and how that can then be recognised and, you know, it can then translate into paid yeah. employment because, Absolutely. you know, it's, it, it's something that I do encourage people to look at as an option, even yeah. just to gain and gauge an idea of whether you want a career in a certain sector, because if by volunteering you, you go and find out it's something you love, fantastic, but if, if not... You know, you've tried it and, you know, you've, you perhaps think, well, actually, do you know what? I did, it's not quite what I thought it was going to be. And nothing's lost and everything's gained because you've had experience. Yeah. And, you know, you've, you've helped an organisation out. But yeah. so for you, 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 gave, you were actually volunteering at that, that organisation and that's where the first job came from. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you're quite right. You pick up skills, you pick up networks of people. Um, mm -hmm. We'll no doubt talk about that later. Um, but it gives you that opportunity um, and it also shows the type of person that you are uh, you know I think you know, if I'm ever looking at a CV and I can see someone has voluntarily undertaken uh, work to support people or a group or an organization you know that that's that's bonus points yeah absolutely absolutely so that then sort of started a career I mean really you were very much within sort of I guess business development and yes yeah, so um i suppose that was kind of my uh, entry into the professional world of um third sector charity organizations um i then then my second job again it was a managerial post for a brand new community uh charity center that had been set up uh in derbyshire right on the borders again um and actually one of the things that I started to take an interest in was kind of public relations, because essentially we, we, we developed this centre and we were planning its official launch. Um, and part of my task was to organise uh, the opening and see what people might come or ideas we could then try and get the news out that this, this was here. So that was an introduction, I suppose, into uh, event planning uh, and thinking about how do we have a good party? Um, and then also about um, PR and profile raising. Um, so I had a little bit of a talent for that. I had also then done some more voluntary uh, work as an intern um, through um, one of my school friend's fathers, who was head of PR for, uh, I think at the time it was Plessy, uh, but in Beeston, so at Siemens basically. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd gone and worked in the press office uh, over one of the summers, I think during A-levels actually. Um, and I remember actually, um, funnily enough, again, all, all these things coming back to me now, we'll talk about it. So the two between A-levels, of course, because they're two years. So during my summer holidays, I went as this voluntary intern and worked in the press office, which was really great. And I thought, well, this might be something I might like to go into. Um, and at the end, I'd done such a good job. I think I was given £250 or something like that. Oh, as wow. A, as a little thank you, um, because I'd been doing it full time and I was there all day. Um, a, a great experience. Um, and I spent the £250 on having a great party. <laughs> there is a party. <laughs> There's a theme. There's a theme. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. 
Um, and um, well, it's great so that you celebrated it, though. Do you know what I mean? I think that's yeah. fantastic. That you know, again, there was that opportunity to gain work experience, and this mm. is something I encourage people, you know, who are students who are studying to to gain some experience. Be curious, you know, ask questions. So, who, who do you know? Like you've just demonstrated, you know, yeah. your friend's father. What do they do? Who do you know? And it's looking at the options that you've got available. And so, again, fantastic yeah. demonstration of that. No, no. So I, I kind of developed um, a career in, in the charity third sector uh, around PR, profile raising. That then went into fundraising and development, um, working with corporate partnerships, businesses, essentially working in roles where you could bring people in to support an organisation. And that might have been through funds, it might have been through influence, it might have been by attracting someone to come in as a figurehead or a patron would therefore bring in credence and attract other people to come in as supporters, volunteers or donors. So, you know, that was sort of the world that I was involved in for a long time. And I suppose I started locally. My last, um, I suppose, professional job within there, uh, I was the regional director for a charity called Arthritis Care. Um, and I think I had in my, in my patch, I was looking after about 18 counties. So wow. I think I was going down to the Essex borders, out to the Welsh border, and I think up to just the bottom of Sheffield. So I had a huge area I was looking after. And, and again, you know, I was still relatively young then. So, um, uh, You're still then, young now, Philip. You're still well, young I, now. I suppose so, yeah. Um, and I, again, um, I, I'd never taken an interest in cars and driving. And goodness knows how many driving lessons I've ever had. Um, and I somehow managed to have two cars before I could actually uh, learn to drive and have my driving license. That's another story. But uh, I remember getting that job, uh, which is great. But I had to, um, I had to have a driving license and access to a car to do the job. Um, and so my mother at the time said, "Well, apply for it, and we'll worry about the car and the driving license afterwards." <clears throat> so I got something like. I guess somewhere between a month, four weeks and a month, you know, four and eight weeks to then actually pass my driving test and then sort out a car, um, which miraculously I did just before starting. Yeah. So. Nothing like having yeah. focus, yes. a target, yes. time bound to actually make it happen. Another yeah. great example, oh, we could use you as a coaching tool. <laughs> well, I, I, I had to go to um, Clapham on Sea, I think it was. Um, uh, well, I might have got that wrong. Somewhere near Colchester, mm -hmm. uh, but um, not a particularly pleasant place, but a place to focus. So, um, and actually, the, again, the story, it's funny because I did it and then I failed the, the, um, the driving test. And I real mind the thing at a roundabout. And I was devastated because I think, oh God, what am I going to do? I've got this job starting <laughs> and I need to have a car. Um, but luckily I went back the following week and passed and then... Brilliant. Uh, I was able yeah. to mindset mindset but <laughs> um, yeah so, so the one thing we because obviously we just that's a that's a fabulous story but the one thing i wanted to just highlight was the you've raised millions through for charity within working within charity haven't you uh yes i suppose so it was funny because when we were doing our chat before talking about what we we're going to talk about you said oh send send me through um your cv and of course i've not done a cv i think actually it was 2015 um, when I last started tinkering around with my um, CV, so it's a bit outdated. So I, I had a quick scan, but yeah, no, over over those different roles in the third sector, uh, and then also some of my voluntary work. So <clears throat> I then got involved obviously in voluntary work, uh, and naturally my volunteer work was around fundraising and events generally, or, or developing things. So. Yeah, I've, I've raised quite a bit of money, I suppose. But that, you yeah. know, that, that was that was part of my job that I was supposed to do that. So yeah, but that, but you did it and you achieved it, and, and all of the experience that you say you've gained along the way of sort of PR and putting on events and marketing. So this is this is where I'm kind of coming up to now, to kind of present day. So so yes, you you very kindly sent me over your CV, and I've got it up to five years ago, <laughs> yeah. and uh, that sort of I've had obviously had to read through it myself, which is. Uh, great because obviously that, that's all embellished a lot we'd already spoken about anyway but what where did where did the idea obviously to bring us really right up to date how did the whole cuckoo come about 
I mean, I'd like to know about the name as well, but you know, it just really, how did it come about and how did you go about sort of delivering it? Because you've really got sort of so many organizations, different types and varieties within the, you know, within the networking group now. And I don't, I almost don't like to use the word networking because it's networking so many people. I'll go, oh, networking, which actually, to me, networking is, is just chatting, you know, it's just enjoying somebody's company and just asking and being curious and asking about them. And then, you know, if they're interested, they may ask you about you and then conversations go on and people, I mean, obviously I've had some really good business through Cuckoo, through the, the connections I've made and business that I've had referred on to me by members who've referred me on to other people. And, and that's how, that's the beauty of networking. I think, you know, people have a perception that you've got to go in somewhere and go, right, I'm Sarah and this is what I do. You're going to listen to me for two minutes and then you're going to give me all your business. And it's really, you're, you couldn't, it's so far removed from that, Cook. I mean, it is, it's such a pleasure to go to the events. Um, and usually I'm one of the last men standing. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I think that's always a good sign. Modern Farm, yeah, I think I, I think I was. It was literally sort of cold and shivery, but it was a great location and uh, lots of cocktails on offer. Um, however, do please fill in the gap. What, how did that then become Cuckoo? Okay, so um, if I nip back to Arthritis Care, um, that charity had some real issues. And I think overnight um, they decided to, I think cut the organization by about 60 percent okay. um, so I, I was basically made redundant the regional office was all over the country and closed down so I thought you know what am I going to do um, and then I essentially went into then being a consultant around what I what I was doing I did some work uh, with my mother as well who had a similar career um, uh, so that's what I was doing um, then Stephen Goddard, who is my uh, fellow co-founder, and I were talking about doing something around businesses. We, in our careers, we've both been to all sorts of different types of networking things, um, both good and bad. You know, I'd been to um, networking events at um, Westminster and London and some very interesting places, uh, but also I'd been to the more local ones where you say you get your well, I think actually you said you've got two minutes. I think you're very lucky if you've got two minutes because a lot of that style is 60 seconds or even less now. Um, so we'd been to lots of networking things and we just started to think, you know, could this be done better? Could it be done differently? But we were spurred on because we'd be at these networking events, the types you described. We'd be at the back of the room listening to someone doing a presentation, usually on something really dull and boring like, tax or website security and and i'm sorry if anyone deals in tax and website security but they're not interesting subjects to anybody unless you're in those fields unless you as a business need that right now and then so of course you'd be there at eight, eight in the morning listening to someone going on about a presentation that was actually designed probably to try and sell you something and loads of businesses were there saying god oh, isn't this boring i don't know why i come this is such a waste of time i never even getting from it so we'd hear all these negative comments and we just kind of thought well maybe we could do something that was a bit different a bit more creative a bit more fun and also how can we make it more authentic how can we make it more effective so we we essentially try to do two things one set out to kind of change the landscape of uh, networking to do something that was appealing and fun um, but there was also effective for businesses. It's no point of having, uh, you know, you could go to the swishest hotel, you, you know, great places with a load of people, but actually at the end of the day, if business isn't happening or developing, or you're not getting something from it, then people will just drift away because it becomes essentially a social chat shop. Um, so we wanted to do that, but at the same time, we wanted to also build something that would also be supportive to businesses, supportive to the wider community, um and do some good and hopefully that's what we've we've achieved with cuckoo connect today so we launched cuckoo in 2016 uh originally in leicestershire um we had a great um launch event um lots of people telling us it won't ever work networking saturated um i'll be surprised if you get that many people to a launch event 
So we got a lot of people saying, no, 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 won't work, won't work. Um, but it did. Um, we got a lot of passion in the idea, the concept and the model and what we wanted to do. Um, but of course, until it started and started working, we, we, we just didn't know whether or not it would be a success. And Cuckoo Connect has essentially built now to be all over the East Midlands and even to the wider West Midlands uh, and, and, and nationally in some respects, um, because it has been effective, because it has been appealing, like you've talked about yourself, <coughs> but also that when we were doing things in Leicestershire only, people from Nottinghamshire or Derbyshire would come over and they have a nose because they'd seen something on social media or someone had told them something good about it. And then they'd go away. And then we started to get people saying, well, 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 will you do a cuckoo in our area? Or when are you coming? Or will you ever do something in Nottingham? Or will you do something in Lincoln? Um, and then again, developing again, because we're very supportive and collaborative of a whole range of organizations, as you said, charities, business initiatives, um, awards, all sorts of things. Um, organizations would say, well, we could really do with cuckoo in our area. Um, and that's how Cuckoo has, has built up. We never had, um, well, we never really had a business plan, which um, I always tell people. Um, so our, our plans, uh, Cuckoo really developed organically and by popularity. Um, we never had a grand plan and still don't, that we want Cuckoo everywhere. And whenever we do think, well, okay, we'll extend Cuckoo to cover this area, we're very cautious because if it's stretched or diluted too much, we feel that the, the magic that makes it effective for people like you and fun and appealing, you know, we, 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 there's a very careful balance of the recipe that makes up cuckoo, I suppose. Mm. But I think that's the beauty of um, the fact that it is growing organically because as you sort of, as you say, as you, as you sort of get it to a position, you kind of like, you can hold it and you can support it in that position. And, you know, it's working. And you've, you, you know, you've, you've done that growth and you've got to that point, then you can move it along because you know it is working. And I think sometimes you've, you've got this decision where, right, it needs to be here, 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 here. Then you do stretch it too much and then you have overgrown too quickly because, like you've said, yeah. organic growth and because people want it. But you, you, you're actually being very mindful about how you grow it as well. And therefore, yeah. that's why this, you know, it does continue and to grow and be successful. Because it is. I mean, we spoke earlier about the, the environment. It is it's always in a great location. There's always some nibbles and food available, whether they're canapes or... I seem to recall the toasties at Pira being absolutely awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, well, no, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, for people that perhaps aren't so familiar with Cuckoo Connect, so we're a business membership service at the heart of what we do is business connecting or networking um we'll say so we have what we call monthly connect receptions in each county every month and they're always at a different venue or a different business the idea behind that is one because it will be appealing to the people coming but also because we want to support and promote and highlight some of these great great places to go to in our in our locations in our local counties in our uh you know local region because they're also uh you know when you think about inward investment when a big business like Amazon thinks, right, am I gonna go and set up in Derbyshire or am I gonna go somewhere outside of London? They're looking at what is there in Derbyshire for me to, to do? Why will people come and live here? Uh, is there talent here? Uh, you know, what are the homes like? What's the uh, culture and the heritage like for people to come? Because Amazon need to know that they're gonna get good talent to come and work for them in Derbyshire. So by us supporting and highlighting all these great places, is highlighting the, the offer of the East Midlands to inward investment, whether or not that's um, national or international. And, you know, it, it all plays a, it plays a small part, I'm sure, but it all helps. Uh, do you know what? I'd not, I never even thought about that concept of it at all. And, you know, now you've highlighted it, I can see it. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's great um, because people do see what, yeah. you know, and people do, and you've got people come back time and time again. And then obviously that radiates out and more, more people are aware, and obviously the PR and you, and the promotion and all this is, of the events and the past events and the almanacs that you produce and it's 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 you know it, it speaks volumes for itself and it is it's it's a great place to go and i guess you've been able to build that because of all that past experience because of the opportunities that you've recognized that you've had along the way and you and let's go back to the fact you like a party philip <laughs> yeah well no, it's funny because 
um, you know, through all my kind of educational years and even kind of A-level time in my early career, all the things that people said in my life were, you know, that weren't going to help you get a job, you're not going to be able to make a career out of that, it's not a qualification. You know, people that study um, drama and music and the arts um, and uh, all the things that, you know, I was bullied for, they're actually all the things that have allowed me to put all of my skills from those into doing something that's a job and a career um, that has also allowed me to, um, you know, with Stephen, create an organisation that stands out and is different. Um, so actually, in a way, it's a bit of a full circle of, you know, you're almost targeted and bullied at school uh, from all of those early experiences about being different. Um, but actually, that has served me well because by being different has allowed us to set up something which uh you know is a, is a great great success and a great service to lots of businesses and the wider community because it's different and that's the beauty of it and i think it's fantastic i mean and again it's it the fact that you you've aligned with all your sort of talents your passions and your you know what drives you what motivates you and that's where success lies is when you are content within yourself because you're doing something with with those skills and those talents that you've got and then you're naturally nurturing them and you're being your authentic true self and yeah. you've created a career you know to be you know at the end of the day we are all different but once we embrace our differences and yeah. you know become our authentic true selves we you know we tap into that you know that, that's where this you know you become you know your authentic true self in terms of being happy your career's aligned and you yeah. can enjoy you know it, it, your work isn't work anymore because you're enjoying what you do i mean yes yeah. you're going to get challenges along the way we always do however you don't yeah. mind them because you recognize it as a learning opportunity yeah no 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 absolutely and you know even now um you know we're we're, we're recording this um during the um you know the, the coronavirus pandemic um so we've adapted what we've done but we're also you know playing our part by supporting uh, a whole range of businesses and organizations not just our members uh, but actually anyone in the region uh, with a load of services that we've we sort of set up to support uh, businesses during this time so absolutely because you, you, you kind of pivoted and you created daily a bulletin that you've turned both of you, you've turned up for you've presented you've represented people within the group including myself you know and you've you've done a presentation broadcast monday to friday every single week since lockdown started and that takes some that takes some doing that takes some dedication that takes some turning up to do that rather yeah. than you know just sort of putting your feet up going well there's nothing happening we'll leave it no. you know well, it, and, and that's tantamount to the success and i guess that's the the discipline again that you had you know through your chorister training you know you it, again there's another full circle you you do don't you 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 know present it turn up you know yeah. and you want to do what's best to support other people and give them a platform as well because at the end of the day you know so many of us i mean myself included although this isn't about me but you know all the stuff i've been doing hasn't been for profit <laughs> yes and it's great and i like showcasing people and i you know it's been great talking to you this morning so what what have we got to look forward to when lockdown lifts, come on, tent tantalizers and tempters, well, what, what well, will be the next Cuckoo event? Oh, and before you go, I'd like to know what Cuckoo stands for, please. All right, okay. Um, well, at, at the precise moment, I, I hope that uh, uh, there'll be a great party uh, that awaits for us after lockdown. Um, we are, we're making plans, um, but we're not quite sure yet in terms of the guidance from government as to what that will be. So. Um, if we suddenly get to a point where we can start doing things again, well, that's great. But it, it's quite tricky to navigate now to know what the restrictions will be and how phased they'll be. Um, we, uh, I'm actually having um, a briefing with an MP this afternoon um, who's taking advice from us about how the pandemic is affecting smaller businesses and how that uh, how networking is affected by smaller businesses because I think with the pandemic um, the term was work gatherings there's a vast difference to having a team lunch or a team night out or gathering people together for a you know a morning briefing to a, um, a single person that's um, running a business 
that needs to go and network because for a lot of businesses networking is a is a vital lifeline it's how they advertise it's their marketing it's their building clients meeting clients building development and associates and partnerships so um yeah this afternoon we're 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 having a you know an advice session in terms of advising on how how the pandemic is affecting people brilliant brilliant uh, but yeah and you mentioned the the carry on cuckoo daily uh video business bulletins uh today was our 60th one wow uh, seems amazing uh but as you say we put these together um to essentially keep promoting and helping and connecting businesses even though we're in lockdown um we've got our cuckoo cocktail hour tomorrow evening which is our twice monthly um, free online networking event on Facebook. So we're doing lots of things still to, to support um, and we'll do. So if there's anyone out there listening uh, you know, to this interview and they're a business or a community organisation, they want some help, they should, uh, you know, they should get in touch. In fact, um, could, you, could you let people know um, how they can contact you and uh, Kuki, yeah, sure. please? So um, the easiest way or the best way for us at the moment because we're being inundated with requests for help uh, is to email us uh, at hello at cuckooconnect.co.uk and cuckoo is spelled k-u-k-u -U. Um, that's all you need to do so uh, just very quickly just to say that we've got the uh, daily video business bulletins they feature all different businesses community events uh, news business advice tips uh, we talk about a different venue each day we even have a song of the day um, so if you want your business or community organization featured or you've got some news you've got an offer a free discount something you're doing to help other businesses send that through to us um, and also we can feature you on the cuckoo cocktail hour there are various other things as well that we're doing to support businesses but if you drop us an email to say I need some help or I'd like to know more then then we can go from there um, and then the cuckoo story. So um, I think really Stephen takes uh, the credit for, for this because part of Stephen's background is in uh, branding and design. So um, he had looked into all the different types of name trends and brand trends of how many syllables and uh, at the time there were a lot of um, brands being set up where you'd have two surnames like um, Smith and Jones or Jack Wills, those sorts of names. Um, but what he wanted was something that was uh, memorable, something that was quirky and that would stand out to be different because that's what Cuckoo Connect is, is partly about. Um, and he wanted people to ask the story, that, the question that you just asked, where did it come from? Uh, and the answer is it didn't really come from anyway. It was what can we come up with that was a little bit quirky and he just sort of settled on uh, this, this word cuckoo um, because it sounded a bit kooky, a bit different and that's what we wanted to do with Cuckoo Connect being a different type of thing. Um, the funny part of the story is that three, four months after we had launched Cuckoo Connect, um, my aunt who lives in France who was talking to me about it saying, oh, well done, looks very good. And she sort of said, well, it looks very, uh, an interesting name that you've used for it. Um, I said, oh, well, you know, what, why is that? And she says, well, in French, the word cuckoo is a slang word and a bit of a rude word for a certain part of the female body. Oh, no. <laughs> so if we, um, <clears throat> if, we, if we ever find Cuckoo Connect in France, uh, we might have to... Uh, might have to change it. You know yeah. what, just before we literally finish, you've triggered what I, I didn't mention it earlier, but you mentioned working at Plessy. And Plessy became GEC Plessy, and then they changed it and became GPT. Um, yeah. That was the acronym. And yeah. apparently in France, je peux te means that you have also trumped. So we should... <laughs> to finish on, a, finish on a couple of acronyms and notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But do you so... know what? It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this morning, Philip. Thank you so much for... Um, sharing your journey and your story um, and I hope you know people listening it inspires them to sort of really you know tap into look at you know the opportunities that have presented whether they're good or bad and what learning you've had from them and sort of align yourself with sort of your differences and your you know what what drives you what your talents and your passions are and you can make a career out of it and even in lockdown you can continue to make a career out of it if you think differently and you get creative and creative is not meaning pens and pencils and colouring pen, you know, it is just 
thinking differently. Creative is a, is a word for, you know, exploring, looking at things in a different way. Um, so yeah, and that's what uh, Philip and Stephen have done at Cuckoo. They've really have looked at things in a different way and that's what's created their brand and what they've been doing throughout lockdown as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to the party when it comes back and uh, we have a socially distancing uh, drink in a field somewhere, no doubt. But uh, well, thank, well, thank you so, so much, Philip. No, 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 not at all. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we're very much looking for when we can come out of lockdown as well. And um, as soon as we, um, as soon as we are, we shall let you know. Thank you very much indeed.